sure. So I, I forgot, P Peter. It's 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 your turn now or mine? Uh, it it's yours. Yeah. It's mine. I see. All right. So uh, uh, I guess we can start now. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome back from the break. It's my pleasure to introduce the next uh, talk on networks and uh, graphical models. Uh, uh, it's a theme that is uh, uh, co-run by Christian and uh, Ankur, and uh, Christian will give the talk. Well, not just. I decided to give the MIT site not quite their fair share, but a little bit at least. Sounds good. Uh, so, I mean, just like Mike and Kostet were working very much together, Anka and I did this very much together, so I felt I should give him some of the screen time. Um, this is, oh wow, this is not, doesn't want to proceed. Let me, is it maybe better to share the screen and not the app? Well, as long as you don't have any confidential information on your screen, uh, that could work. Uh, but it seems not to work. You know, I had a few embarrassing accidents when I try to share the screen, so I, I don't do that anymore. But. Uh, um, yeah. So let me try it again. Is am I still sharing the screen or not? Uh, no, you are not sharing the screen. Okay. Okay. You okay. Want to yeah. Good. Okay, so this is uh, uh, networks and graphical models theme. You see our team. It's a nice mixture of MIT and Berkeley. Uh, a lot of us have already worked together and many of us have worked on both sides. Um, so I will talk about the network park and then Anka will talk a little bit about graphical models. Um, so, and uh, I thought I could, even though some of you might have seen graph once, uh, a lot of you might have seen it in the context of graph limits. I thought I will show how graph fonts are used for uh, modeling network estimation recommendation things and then get to some of the algorithmic questions which are there. So um, as motivations, just think about what is, so the whole thing started by us thinking what's the correct notion of a limit of a large sparse network. Um, and but very much related is actually how do we model large pass networks and how do we estimate recommendation systems is one possibility. Another one recently uh, done by some people at Stanford is the question, can you uh, do information dissemination on networks, the KKT model and things like that. So, um, just to these three questions. So if you look at many networks you see in the world, they look eerily similar, right? So can we find a way of defining a limit which makes similar networks the same in the limit? So is LinkedIn and Facebook the same or not? And so we came up with the notion of graph limits which led to the notion of a graph one. And I won't assume you know what it is, so I will tell it to you in a little while. Okay, the other question is, okay, you want to model large networks. So let's assume you have a single snapshot of Facebook today and you want to learn a network model and then predict how the network will look when it's double as large. Um, and it turns out, again, the answer is a graph one. So you can estimate, assuming that you have this non-parametric model of a graph one, we can learn the generating graph one. And once you have learned it, you can generate new networks, maybe larger to see how they look in the future or smaller because you want to test some algorithm which you uh, can't test on the huge net. Um, and finally, um, there's a question of matrix completion or estimation problems. We sort of all know it from Netflix, Mike talked about it. And they're actually interesting question, I think it's intersection of our theme and his theme but I will not go into these here. So 
Um, again, it turns out that you can have an underlying graph on which uh, generates these rankings. And if it's a uh, finite rank, you can very efficiently estimate uh, the missing entries in this matrix, uh, which is work with some of the people. Uh, Dev Bava is in part of the C. So, um, so what is a graph? Okay, so the short answer, if you sort of don't want to do mass, well, a little bit of mass, it's a function of two variables, and it describes the limit of a sequence of graphs, that's how we invented it, but actually it also describes a non-parametric model for random graphs, or more generally a probability distribution over recommendations. So um, I give you two definitions. The first one will work for the limits and the model. So a graph one is just a function defined over a probability space. So it has two variables. So therefore we have here omega cross omega um, and it should be integrable for, to make it sort of treatable. And if you go to the recommendation system, you make it a little bit more general. So you don't have just one feature. So think of, the, I mean, if we want to go to network modeling, for example, you should think of the features as features describing your users. And then this function will tell, tell you about the affinity between different users. And in the second setting, you have actually two different spaces because there's no reason that people rating items and items to be rated should have the same feature set. So you have two possible probability spaces. And then the graph one is a function which is not symmetric anymore. And it doesn't map into R plus, but it maps in general into a probability distribution on one up to K. K is two, then it's just a one probability. So it's a subset here, but in general, it's more general. Okay, and I will first walk you through an application um, which actually has found application in a little startup. Uh, I can't tell you too much about the startup and luckily I don't know too much about it because I'm bad in keeping secrets. So I have to ask my collaborators how the startup works. So you have the following problem. You have um, ratings, Amazon, Hulu, Netflix, and you have this matrix and you observe a very sparse matrix. And now you want to fill in this matrix and see will this little girl like name of Okay, and you want to put some stars there. Related is network completion. Okay, so you have some network on LinkedIn and you want to sort of guess should they introduce these two people to each other or not. So you want to predict would they connect to each other or do I waste my advertising dollars connecting people which don't want to connect anyhow. Um, you can also have weighted networks. So you can send emails. I used to work at Microsoft, so that's why you have the Outlook sign here. Um, you can do recommendations uh, in of whatever way. I mean, most of our networks in the real world are weighted. And I mean, even if you think about transmitting COVID, right, it depends how often I see somebody. So for your networks, you really have a frequency of interactions. You observe some of them and you might want to fill in the aspect. So the framework is that of matrix completion. And in the background, we think that this was generated by, let's say this is a movie. So this movie has some features and this row, which is the users has some features as well. And then given these features, there will be some probability distribution on ratings. And you would like to learn the probability distribution from what you see here and then fill this in. Okay. so. How do we usually do that? Well, usually we do collaborative filtering. So what we do is we look at the movies you rate, we look at the movies I rate, and then we will give, we will, will claim that the two of us are similar if we give similar ratings to movies we both have rated, or short if we like similar movies. Now the problem is that if you have a very sparse observation, there will be no overlap. So what do you do? Well, so our idea was we do expanding neighborhoods. This actually came from some graph estimation algorithms out of the Princeton group, uh, which used this idea first. So we are applying it here to the recommendations. 
Um, they used it to actually estimate an underlying graphon. We actually avoid estimating the graphon, which is a good thing I will explain to you in a little moment. So what do you do? Well, we look at the movies rated by this little girl, and then we look who rates this movie, and so on. So if you want, we look at the network neighborhood of this girl in the bipartite graph of rated movies and people. We go on and on and on. And eventually, if this side is square root of n, by the birthday paradox, you get common ratings. And now you can start to compare things. Okay, and there are many ways to compare. Uh, we will compare the product of the ratings along the path, but that's just some way. The main point is that you compare these network neighborhoods. And it turns out this just works next. Okay, let me give you another. So it's nicely in the sense that if I have finite rank, you can see I only need a finite number of observ observations per row. So roughly proportional to the rank squared. So if the rank is five, rank is roughly the dimensions of the feature space. So if that is five, then you will need 25 entries per, per row. So once I've rated 25 movies, you don't care that there are millions of movies. I only have to rank sort of up around D squared many. Okay, so now let's switch to, to network modeling. So that is originally goes back to the um, social science less such community. Uh, Ola Bas Janssen Riordan invented the model I'm giving you here. Um, so how does this model work? Well, you have some feature space. And again, you have a graph on, which is the function on this feature space squared and some distribution. And now you choose for each of your users some feature according to some probability distribution on the feature space. And then you connect i and j with probability w. Well, if you want it sparse, you might want to sparse it down. And if w want, uh, you want w to represent power loss, maybe w is really unbounded. So you better take a minimum of one in this project here. Okay, and then you output this object. And now, given a single sample, you would like to estimate this graph. So this is slightly different from usual estimation where we have many samples. Here we have one sample. If you want, it's very much related to dependent samples because you have different pieces of this graph, but they're not really independent. So it's an example of dependent samples, which is one of the themes we want to look at. Um, there's some identifiability issues that are technically well understood. I mean, since you learned about couplings and Wasserstein distance, essentially, if you can couple your probability spaces such that the two graph ones become the same, then they should be considered identical. And up to that equivalent class, you can sort of, so you output just one graph one, but you're well aware that there could be many others representing the same object. And we avoided that in the recommendation system. Um, we just used that underlying model was represented by such an object. Essentially what we did is we replaced the hidden latent features by the observed feature of the network neighborhood. And that actually made the whole thing work. Okay, so how would we do this estimation? I, well, I have a little bit time for Ankur. So assume we have this one sample. The basic idea in this is we want to approximate W by the best block model approximation to the adjacent matrix. Okay, so you observe your network, you average over little blocks. Okay, so this is you sum over, so this is block i, well, this is log block pi of i, and you sum over all i in that block, so you sum over all ij in a given block, and then you minimize over the best possible alignment with blocks. And then you claim, well, this guy should be almost something like a low frequency estimate of your adjacency matrix and your output set. Okay. So well, if you want a graph on your outwards a piecewise function, which is constant, so you sort of think of a little checkerboard with width one over k, one over k squares, and then you put these entries in there. So if you really want to output the function. Um, good. And so this works. And then there's sort of a question which hints at something we will really want to analyze in this 
uh, part, which is differential privacy. Okay, so we all know that releasing statistical information about people is difficult if you want to respect their privacy. And it certainly becomes difficult if you're on networks, right? So your links on Facebook really say a lot about you. And you might say, well, just de anonymize no, anonymize, sorry. And the problem is it actually can easily be undone, okay? So it doesn't help that you don't know who I am because you have side information. It's easy to learn who I am. And so what's a principled way to do that? It's differential privacy. Um, and our claim is that you can actually do that. Let me just jump over that because I don't want to walk you through what. So here's first the summary of my view of graphs, graphons, and recommendation systems. I haven't talked to you about that, but essentially, okay, a graph has a vertex set and a matrix, and then the graphon is a continuum analog. It has a continuous feature space and a function of two variables then you can use that to model graphs. And then you can actually use graph estimation to get back here. And the recommendation system is similar. Now that you, ha you have two feature spaces, you have a probability distribution valued graph on, you get a rating matrix, and then you use matrix completion. So you never actually solve this problem, which means you also avoid the problem of identifiability. So I think that's how our approach differs from that of the Princeton group. They really try to estimate an underlying graph form, or in their case, stochastic block model, whereas we avoid it. So let me finish with a few open problems. I'm sorry. Um, so, a lot is known about the statistical efficiency, their min max lower bounds and things like that. We know very little about how to do efficiently do graph on estimate. You might have seen I had some sum over all permutations that obviously screams exponential time. If you glanced what I said for differential privacy, we use the exponential algorithm. Again, that smells like exponential time. So maybe actually we can't do it. So this is an interesting question which really deserves explorations. There's also a well-known relationship between differential privacy and robustness. So can we explore that in the context of networks? Okay, and then the question is, use sort of the underlying graph on assumption to design efficient algorithms. So this is, for example, an example that people showed you might have heard of the independent cascade model, you want to estimate where you should seed information in a network. And they sort of it's NP hard, there's some approximation algorithms which are complicated to implicate. I actually did some of those myself. But um, it turns out that if you have an underlying hidden graph on, random seeds just are all you need. So this is sort of work out of Stanford. I don't think it's published yet, but it sort of involves economists so accept it to be published in five to 10 years. So with that, I will hand it over to Uncle. Great, let me just start sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Not yet. No, it says that it yet. started screen sharing. D double click to enter full screen mode, it says. Oh boy. Let me just retry it. Yeah, now you can see good. Okay, yeah, great. It's good now. All right. Okay, so um, yeah, thanks for. Um, giving me a few minutes to talk about this. So I don't have much time to tell you too much about graphical models, but you know, what I hope to do is just give you an idea about some interesting vignettes. You know, I think when you talk about graphical models, these are things that many of you will have seen before. And there's this belief that they've been, you know, studied since antiquity. So there must not be, you know, open algorithmic or statistical problems, but I want to try and disabuse you of that idea in this talk and show you at least one example where there's some pretty wide gaps in our understanding. And we've only made it a little ways since then. So let's start off with some basic notions. So imagine you have a high dimensional Gaussian, another problem that's been studied since antiquity. 
Now to put this in the language of graphical models, what we really care about is the inverse of the covariance matrix, which is usually called the precision matrix. That's really the main character in what I'm gonna be telling you about. So that's theta. And we'll be interested in cases where theta is sparse because actually the reason that theta is natural is because it captures the important conditional independence structure. So the Markov structure in the sense of a graphical model. So what you can do is you can take these kinds of high dimensional distributions and you can associate a graph with them. So you can create, if it's an N dimensional Gaussian, a graph on N nodes where you put an edge if and only if the corresponding entry in the precision matrix is non-zero. And the important thing is that the graph really captures the conditional independence aspects of this model because two nodes turn out to be independent, conditioned on a separator, if and only if, that separator blocks all paths in a graph theoretic sense, that any path from I to J must pass through the set XU, which you're conditioning on. So, you know, one of the questions that, you know, I think um, it is surprisingly pretty open, it's something that you would have actually thought was closed, was can you learn Gaussian graphical models from very few samples? So the truth is that GGMs show up in all kinds of applications, particularly in science and social sciences. But one of the reasons we care about them is because in a lot of those settings, we have very few samples, but we have tons of variables. So we think of them as somehow the canonical type of graph structure that, that we can learn when we're in those settings. So just to give you an example of this, this is um, a network taken from a pretty recent paper which is inferring something about the genetic network underlying certain types of cancer. And the way that they do this is using Gaussian graphical models as a primitive. So trying to learn the precision matrix and creating a graph based on whatever they've learned. And the key point is that they have very few samples. So you hope to learn these kinds of things and a number of samples that's logarithmic in the number of nodes that you're trying to fit an interesting model to. So, you know, these types of things are actually extremely well studied. There's, um, you know, a very famous paper of Friedman, Hasty, and Tipsharani, which uses the graphical lasso. So it uses a lot of ideas from, you know, compressed sensing like lasso and adapts them to Gaussian graphical models. But what I, what, I, what I want to convince you of is that they're actually hidden assumptions that govern, you know, when these things work, which maybe it makes sense to take a more sober look and ask whether they are or are not satisfied. So there are also approaches like the Klein estimator that you know, is in some sense related to graphical lasso with a little bit incomparable guarantees. But the thing that I wanna highlight is there's this recent work of Misra, Vufre, and Lakov, which you know, re really revisited this problem and you know, asked what is the right information theoretic dependence? Because there's a key parameter that I didn't talk about which really governs the non-degeneracy of the model. So I mentioned that we care about theta as being sparse, right? Now, you can't hope to learn which entries in theta are zero or non-zero if the entries are too close to zero. So the natural thing is to somehow assume that the entries that are non-zero are noticeably non-zero, but you have to be very careful with the right normalization. It turns out that the right information theoretic bound is to look at the absolute value of the off-diagonal entry and compare it to the geometric average of the diagonal entries. But this has a nice interpretation in terms of you know, the covariances and the variances of these things. So it turns out that a lot of the assumptions which are fine in compressed sensing, things like the restricted isometry property, that you know, every set of you know, 2K columns of your matrix acts like an isometry, are really not super relevant in Gaussian graphical models because you do expect to have some variables that are very strongly dependent on each other because that's actually the structure that you're trying to fit in a lot of these scientific and social science applications. And it's not always reasonable to assume that a variable's conditional variance when you condition on everything else in the network is pretty large compared to its variance to begin with. A lot of these you know, natural models have very strong dependencies and they become ill-conditioned very quickly. So the surprise is that even when these things are you know, ill-conditioned, you just need this non-degeneracy parameter kappa to be bounded away from zero. And then information theoretically, you can actually learn with a logarithmic number of samples where D here is the sparsity of each of the columns of your matrix or rows. And just to give you a concrete example of you know, something simple that you can wrap your heads around, which you know, is a very simple Gaussian graphical model, but has very strong dependencies, is imagine you do something like a Gaussian random walk on a line. 
if you take the node at the very end that has a giant variance, its variance is n, but the conditional variance is tiny because if you tell me my leftmost neighbor, then my conditional variance is one. So it's a very ill-conditioned model. And there are all kinds of things like this that exhibit these strong dependencies. So this question is, believe it or not, basically wide open. We have some you know, partial work on it, but this is really an invitation to think about these kinds of issues. So for something called walk summable Gaussian graphical models that contain Gaussian free fields in MTP2, we used a lot of ideas from Laplacian solvers to design polynomial time algorithms with logarithmic sample complexity. But I think this is also indicative of how some of these themes are very interconnected, right? Because for some of these things, it might just be that there are fundamental computational versus statistical trade-offs. It turns out that when you talk about the right information theoretic bounds, the key primitives that show up are things like sparse linear regression without the restricted isometry property, but we don't know a reduction the other direction. So are these types of GGMs related to the conjectural computational versus statistical trade-offs there? And you know, looking outwards, I think for a lot of these different graphical models problems, there are a lot of assumptions that people make that you know, govern the algorithms that they want to analyze that maybe don't hold in a lot of settings. So I think you know, one of the major things that many of us would like to do is revisit some of these things and understand whether there's scope for designing more exciting algorithms. So I'll stop there and uh, Christian and I are happy to take any questions you guys might have. Right, Christian and Ankur, thank you. Uh, we have uh, one minute for questions. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Yeah, I, I do have some questions, but uh, uh, I, I think I'll just, uh, uh, you know, for the sake of uh, you know, keeping things on schedule, I, I will just uh, ping you guys directly. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you again. And uh, uh, the next talk will be by Michael. And this will be about algorithms with predictions. Go ahead, Michael. Are you seeing the front slide okay? I see the front slide and it was your photo. Uh, can you go to the next slide just to double check? Yeah, perfect. Okay, uh, good. So I'll be talking about algorithms with predictions. This is part of the machine learning for algorithms group. And uh, part of what we're doing and what I'll be talking about today is using how we might use machine learning to improve the performance of classical algorithms. The idea is to get the best of both worlds, you know, some want correctness that we expect from our traditional algorithms, but also adaptivity. You know, you can think of it as a beyond worst case analysis type analysis, which I will be describing. Uh, so again, the, the traditional algorithms are based on worst case analysis. And of course that's been great. It's what's been given all us three people jobs for decades, but it isn't everything. And uh, as many of us know, we've been parts of the theory community have definitely been trying to go beyond worst case analysis, the, a phrase um, popularized, I think, by Tim Roughgarden um, uh, and established by Tim Roughgarden. And of course, there's been that, you know, sort of all along, we've looked at things like random or perturbed or limited inputs or approximation algorithms. And now we wanna see how machine learning can possibly give us more. All right. so. Machine learning can be used to give predictions. And then, so the question is, is if we assume that we are getting some sort of good predictions, not perfect predictions, but good predictions, can we do better results than just using our, our worst case algorithms? 
And of course, this leads to the question of how can we be safe or what should we be doing in case the predictions are bad? Um, so we'd like provable statements of the form that, you know, if my predictions are this good, my algorithm's performance will correspondingly be good. And we call this sort of framework algorithms with predictions or, or sometimes learning augmented algorithms. All right, so here's a, a quick outline. Um, Piotr tells me I'm overly ambitious and there's no way I'll finish everything and he's probably right. So I may leave off some stuff at the end, but we'll, we'll see what I can get through in the, the half hour. Um, so let's start with a simple example of search, right? So we've got an array of integers and we've got a query. We need to find it in the array. So we can just do binary search, start in the middle and, and there we go and, and we find the element, okay? Um, an alternative, if we have a prediction, is start with the predicted place and then use sort of a, a doubling binary search, like one to the left, then two to the left, then four to the left, until we find an interval where it appears. And then we can use sort of a, a binary search once we find the actual interval that the element appears in. But the idea is to use a prediction to help start us on our search. All right, so binary search is order log n. And what you can see, or it's a, a pretty simple analysis, this prediction-based search is order log of whatever your prediction error is, right? And here I'm not counting whatever 